Hi, my name is William Huang and welcome to Pharmacology. Pharmacology is a high yield subject on step one. Besides memorizing the characteristics of key drugs, spending some extra time to really get familiar with the core principles will pay big dividends on test day. Understanding four key equations, volume of distribution, clearance, loading dose, and maintenance dose is absolutely essential. The first graph is a michaelis menten graph that should be familiar from biochemistry and relates the reaction rate to the substrate concentration. Rate is measured along the y-axis and substrate concentration is along the x-axis. Generally, as the substrate concentration increases, reaction rate also increases. The graph is labeled with some important parameters. Vmax is the maximum reaction velocity and is directly proportional to the enzyme concentration. Vmax can also be thought of as representing efficacy, a term that will be defined later. So higher Vmax is reflective of a higher efficacy. Km is a measure of an enzyme's affinity for its substrate and is defined as the substrate concentration at one half Vmax. So a high Km actually reflects a low affinity and a low Km reflects a high affinity. Another way to think of Km is in terms of potency, another term that will be discussed in more detail later. For now, just know that a low Km reflects a high potency. The second graph shown is a line weaver burke plot. It is also known as a double reciprocal plot because it is the same information as the michaelis menten graph above, but now the y-axis is the reciprocal of velocity, 1 over V, and the x-axis is the reciprocal of substrate concentration, 1 over substrate concentration. It is useful to plot the information in this way because now the y-intercept represents the inverse of Vmax, 1 over Vmax, and the x-intercept represents negative 1 over Km. So, when reading this graph, reaction velocity increases as the y-intercept decreases. Km increases as the x-intercept moves to the right, which means that potency decreases as the x-intercept moves to the right. The third graph is important for the test. You should be familiar with how to compare different forms of enzyme inhibition based on the line weaver burke plot. Competitive inhibitors have the following characteristics. They typically resemble the substrate and bind to the active site of the enzyme. Because they bind the active site, their effect can be overcome by increasing the substrate concentration and diluting the inhibitor out. Competitive inhibitors increase Km such that the x-intercept is shifted to the right, which means they decrease potency and affinity. On the other hand, competitive inhibitors do not alter Vmax, hence the y-intercept is unchanged. Non-competitive inhibitors have the following characteristics. They typically do not resemble the substrate and bind the enzyme at a site other than the active site. The inhibition cannot be overcome by increasing substrate concentration. They have no effect on Km, so the x-intercept is the same as the uninhibited graph, and potency slash affinity is unchanged. They do, however, decrease Vmax, which can be seen on the graph by increased y-intercept relative to the uninhibited line. Another way to say the same thing is that non-competitive inhibitors decrease efficacy. The volume of distribution, VD, relates the amount of drug in the body to the plasma concentration. It is defined as the amount of drug in the body divided by the plasma drug concentration. Drugs that distribute in larger spaces have higher VD. Small VD is associated with drugs that are confined to the blood compartment, such as large hydrophilic molecules. Medium VD is associated with drugs that distribute in extracellular space or body water, such as small hydrophilic molecules. Large VD is associated with drugs that distribute through all tissues, such as small lipophilic molecules. For example, if a drug has VD greater than blood volume, that means the drug has characteristics that allow it to diffuse out of the blood vessels and into other compartments of the body. If a drug has a VD equal to blood volume, this means that it is confined to the plasma. VD of plasma protein-bound drugs increases in liver and kidney disease because of decreased protein binding. Clearance relates the rate of elimination to the plasma concentration and is defined as CL equals the rate of elimination of the drug divided by the plasma drug concentration, which is equivalent to the volume of distribution multiplied by the elimination constant KE. It is important to note that clearance does not refer to how much drug is cleared, but to the volume of plasma that the drug is completely removed from per unit time. Thus, it is measured in units of volume per time, generally milliliters per minute or liters per hour. 
For example, if a person has 5 liters of blood and one fifth of the drug is removed from the plasma in an hour, the clearance would be 1 liter per hour. Half life is the time required to change the amount of drug in the body by one half during elimination or constant infusion. The half life equals 0.7 times the volume of distribution divided by the clearance and is a property of first order elimination. A drug infused at a constant rate takes four to five half lives to reach steady state. Bioavailability, F, is the fraction of administered drug that reaches the circulation. For IV administration, F equals one. For oral administration, F equals the fraction of drug that survives the first pass through the liver. Consider the question, how much of the drug do I need to give in order to rapidly reach a target plasma concentration of CP? The answer is given by the loading dose, which is defined as the plasma concentration times the volume of distribution divided by the bioavailability. Note that clearance is not part of the equation for loading dose. Now, what about the question, how much of the drug do I need to give in order to keep the patient's drug concentration at CP? The answer is given by the maintenance dose. For constant IV infusion, maintenance dose equals plasma concentration times clearance divided by bioavailability. Note that the maintenance dose is dependent on clearance. In patients with renal or liver disease associated with impaired clearance, the loading dose does not change, but the maintenance dose is smaller. Let's talk about the elimination of drugs. In zero-order elimination, the rate of elimination is constant regardless of the concentration of drug in the body. A constant amount of drug is eliminated per unit time, resulting in a linear decrease in plasma concentration. Zero-order elimination is less common than first-order elimination, which we'll talk about next. Examples of drugs that undergo zero-order elimination include phenytoin, aspirin, and ethanol. This can be remembered with the mnemonic PEA, which is round like the number zero. In first order elimination, the rate of elimination is proportional to the concentration of drug in the body. A constant fraction of the drug is eliminated per unit time, resulting in an exponential decrease in plasma concentration. Most drugs are removed from the body by first order elimination. Recall from physiology that neutral particles cross the cell membrane much easier than charged particles. The same principles regulate drug reabsorption once the drug is filtered through the glomerulus. Ionized species, or charged particles, get trapped in urine and are cleared quickly because their charge prevents them from crossing plasma membranes. Neutral molecules can be reabsorbed across the tubules. Therefore, if a drug needs to be cleared as quickly as possible from the body, the urine should be adjusted so the drug is in its ionized form. Weak acid drugs such as phenobarbital, methotrexate, and aspirin are ionized in basic urine, as shown by this chemical equation. Hence, bicarbonate is used to treat overdose with a weak acid drug. Weak base drugs, such as amphetamines, are ionized in acidic urine, as shown by this chemical equation. Hence, ammonium chloride is used to treat overdose with a weak base drug. Here's a helpful mnemonic. Drugs are welcomed into the body when they are the same as the urine and rejected when they are different. For example, weak acids are reabsorbed when the urine is acidic and eliminated when the urine is basic. The body increases the excretion of toxins and drugs by transforming them into less lipid-soluble and more ionic particles. This is the basis of drug metabolism. There are two types. Phase 1 metabolism consists mostly of reduction, oxidation, and hydrolysis reactions that usually yield slightly polar, water-soluble metabolites, but which are often still active. When thinking of phase 1, think cytochrome P450. Phase 2 metabolism is characterized by acetylation, glucuronidation, and sulfation. It usually yields very polar, inactive metabolites that can be renally excreted. When thinking of phase 2, think conjugation. Patients who are slow acetylators have greater side effects from and require lower doses of drugs that are metabolized by acetylation, such as isoniazid. Geriatric patients lose phase 1 metabolism first. You can remember this by the mnemonic, Geriatric patients retain GAS, an acronym for the phase 2 conjugation types. Hence, elderly patients, especially those with kidney or liver problems, may require reduced doses of some medications. We now return to the concepts of efficacy and potency. Efficacy is defined as the maximal effect a drug can produce irrespective of the concentration required to achieve this effect. 
In contrast, potency is defined as the amount of drug needed to achieve a given effect. Potency of a drug is directly related to the drug's affinity for its target receptor. These three important diagrams show the characteristic effects of competitive antagonists, non-competitive antagonists, and partial agonists. The y-axis is drug effect and the x-axis is dose. By test day, you should be able to instantly recognize all three forms. Figure A refers to a competitive antagonist. You can see the effect of a competitive antagonist is to shift the curve to the right, which represents a decrease in potency with no change in efficacy. In other words, a higher concentration of the drug is required to achieve a given effect, but the drug can still achieve the same maximal effect. The effect of a benzodiazepine, such as diazepam, on the GABA-A receptor in the presence of flumazenil is an example of competitive antagonism. In figure A, diazepam would correspond to agonist alone, and diazepam plus flumazenil would correspond to agonist plus competitive antagonist curve. Flumazenil decreases the effect of any given dose of diazepam, hence it is beneficial in benzodiazepine overdose. Figure B shows the curve of a non-competitive antagonist. The curve is shifted down for any given dose of the agonist, corresponding to a decrease in efficacy or maximal effect. An example of this is norepinephrine plus phenoxybenzamine acting on alpha receptors. Phenoxybenzamine is a non-competitive antagonist at alpha receptors, so no matter how high the concentration of norepinephrine, its effect will be reduced. Hence, this drug is useful in treating hypertension in patients with pheochromocytoma. Figure C shows a partial agonist. Partial agonists act at the same site as a full agonist, but with reduced maximal effect, that is, decreased efficacy. Potency is a different variable and can be increased, decreased, or unchanged. This independence of potency and efficacy is an important topic on the boards that is frequently tested. In this plot, potency is shown to be increased. A key characteristic of this drug class is that when partial agonists are given alone, they act to stimulate the receptor, but when they are given in the presence of a full agonist, they act to reduce the overall effect. Morphine plus buprenorphine at the opioid mu receptor is an example of how a partial agonist works. When buprenorphine is given to an opioid naive person, he or she will feel an analgesic effect. However, when it is given to a heroin addict who is used to a regular supply of full agonists, he or she may go into withdrawal. Even when heroin is administered, its effects will be partially blocked by buprenorphine. Therapeutic index is a measure of drug safety. It is defined as LD50 over ED50 where LD50 is the dose that is lethal in 50% of the population and ED50 is the dose that is effective in 50% of the population. Ideally, drugs should have a low effective dose and a very high lethal dose, which corresponds to a high therapeutic index. This means accidentally taking a double dose is unlikely to cause harm. Safe drugs have a high therapeutic index. Less safe drugs, like digoxin for example, have lower therapeutic indices.